We're really, really excited to be hosting this informational workshop uh, virtually here from the North Carolina Japan Center. And uh, I'm very, very excited to uh, welcome our guest speakers today. Uh, Christy Ishii, who's out there in sunny California right now, and uh, Oivin Loritsen, who is in Tokyo. And thank you both for joining and uh, for, for making time in your busy schedules to, uh, to talk to our audience today about, you know, really, um, I know there are a lot of people joining today from different uh, perspectives, but really focusing on, you know, living and working in Japan. And, um, you know, it, all of your, your backgrounds, your journeys in that respect and uh, advice for our students. So what I think I'd like to do is um, just give a very brief uh, introduction for myself. My name is Jonathan Brewster. I'm the director of the North Carolina Japan Center. I think most of the attendees know me already. Um, I worked for uh, about 10 years, or I'm sorry, uh, six years at uh, Fujitsu headquarters in Tokyo and supercomputing. And uh, before that, I was based in Shiga Prefecture in the JET program for about three years, so about 10 years total in country. And I've been uh, heading up the Japan Center here now at NC State for about two and a half years. Um, and I do want to give enough time to our guest speakers to really get into their talks. And uh, for uh, everyone, if you have questions for our, our, uh, our guest speakers, I'd like for you to go ahead and put that in the chat box. And we will get to those questions at the end today um, after we hear from our speakers. And um, there might be some overlap, but we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. So without further ado, I think that, and of course I want our guest speakers to, without me having to, to butcher an introduction for, for them, uh, I'd like for them to introduce themselves. And um, so Christy, when you, whenever you're ready, please. Awesome, thank you so much, Jonathan and Oyvind. It's good to be here with you both. And hi everyone, thanks for coming today. Um, it's nice to meet you. I'm Christy Ishii. Like Jonathan said, I'm calling in from California. I'm actually in San Diego right now, if any of you have been here. Um, it's pretty sunny near the beach. I'm really lucky um, and I hope that you have some sun where you are too if it's daytime. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of a background on myself, where I'm from, things that I did kind of before even getting into um, US-Japan relations and things like that. And then a little bit about the programs that I was in, um, some internships and, and stuff like that, and then what I did in Japan professionally and what I'm doing now. So it'll be like a little quick four-part thing. Um, so I'm originally from Monterey, California. I don't know if you've been to Pebble Beach or the Aquarium or read John Steinbeck, but it's pretty much a coastal city. That's where I grew up and was raised, and I was a big sports person. So I played soccer, softball, and volleyball. Um, sports and school was pretty much my life until I moved down to Los Angeles. I went to UCLA, um, was on the women's club volleyball team, did a little bit of things on campus, but did a lot more in the Japantown community. So if you've been to Los Angeles or SF, you know they have Japantowns there in San Jose. So the one in LA was called Little Tokyo. And um, there are a lot of, you know, cultural centers, a museum, lots of, lots of really fun and places to go and good food. Um, and so I was part of the Japanese American Citizens League, um, which is a nonprofit civil rights organization for Asian American, um, you know, uh, just like at the national level. Um, they do a lot of public policy uh, at the district level. We do some chapter organizing at the chapter level. It's a lot more like grassroots organizing um, for things with the youth and also connecting intergenerational um, people in the like Asian American community. And um, I was also part of the Japan America Society when I was down in Southern California. You might know about it, you might be a part of the one um, near you, but that's a really awesome organization that I met a lot of folks who were working between like the US and Japan. I was also part of the US JET Alumni Association. Um, I got involved before going on JET, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But it's a really awesome group of people and everyone's always looking out for you, even if you've not gone on the program yet, if you're just applying for the JET program. Um, there are so many amazing senpais there in the, in the alumni association, so you can always join even if you haven't gone yet. I don't know if they promote that, but I, <laughs> I think it's okay. Um, and 
Let's see. And then the other program that I wanted to talk about was the Global Partners Institute. Um, it's run by ISA in Japan, but it's this um, exchange program type of internship where it's about five weeks out of the year. And I did this before applying for the JET program and it kind of solidified um, the fact that I wanted to go to Japan after college. And um, you go to five different cities and um, you can look it up online, just GPI US. It's pretty amazing. You go to five different cities, five different high schools, and five different homestay families. It's kind of crazy, but it's an amazing experience. And that kind of like integrated and like solidified this desire to like go to Japan. Um, so professional experience wise, my career started in Japan, in Gunmaken. If you've ever been there, it's a pretty rural area. Um, the city that I was in was called Tetebeashi. And no one really knows about it, except that it's one of the hottest places, I guess, in that area of Japan. So you always see it on a hot day. It's like Tatabashi, like shows up with like 43 degrees. It's crazy. Um, but I was a junior high school um, ALT, so not a CIR, but an ALT English teacher assistant. And um, that was a really fun experience because I mentioned I played a lot of sports. I also played piano. And so if you go to a junior high school, um, you can always do activities with students. And so... It was a really unique time for me to have that kind of job where I could actually input all these different things that I enjoyed doing into the extracurriculars. And then being in the class and teaching was okay. Um, not gonna lie, it wasn't like the most exciting part of that <laughs> jet journey. Um, but on the flip side, in the community, I actually joined the men's baseball team. I grew up playing softball for nine years competitively and and kind of spooked out the team in, in Japan because they were not expecting a girl to come onto the men's baseball team. Um, so I told them, hey, can I, can I practice with you guys? And they were a little bit hesitant, but they said, yeah, sure, come on, let's see if you can play, show them I could play. And so I was one of the first women actually on that, on that, in that league to play in actual games with the uniform. And it was an amazing experience. So I, you know, I, I really loved the JET program by the end of it. Um, learned Japanese because I went in with not too much of a language uh, knowledge. And um, after that, though, I realized I don't want to really teach forever. So um, I had planted the seed in my head even before JET that I wanted to live in Tokyo. I didn't know what it would be like. I thought it would be maybe an intercultural communications person. I didn't know what it was. Um, but I ended up landing in a full cycle recruitment position. So full cycle recruiter means that from maybe a message on LinkedIn or you meet someone at a networking event, you introduce them to a company, they go through interviews, you help them with the interview process, coach them through whether or not it's a good culture fit, they get an offer, negotiate the offer with them, help them push for more salary, things like that. And all the way up until they like join the company and I've been there for a few months, that's like a full cycle recruitment um, like cycle. So uh, in the States, I don't know how, much, how many people do that, but in Japan, it's pretty typical of a recruiter. There's not too many that are siloed. It's like the full cycle 360 recruitment. So that's what I was doing for two years. And on next, next to that, like on the side, I was also, um, and still am, but it's virtual now, so not too many events. I'm the Japan chapter president of the JACL, which is that organization I was mentioning that I was a part of in the US. And so what it is in Japan though, because it's not a registered um, NPO in Japan, it's um, a US Japan kind of bridging group. So we help people who are wanting to learn about like Japanese American history or just speak in English. We have Aikaiwa's monthly um, virtually right now online. And we do a lot of like how to navigate Japan as a foreigner type of events um, and help people kind of build community in Japan because sometimes it's not the easiest to find that sense of home when you're away um, in a new place, in a new language, and also working with people who maybe um, it's a little bit more difficult to make friends at work, I think. Um, I don't know how uh, Jonathan and Oyvind will attest to that, but I think it's really nice to have those spaces where you can associate with other you know, foreigners living in, in Japan. Um, so I, I've been doing that for the past two years, which meant I was meeting people like 
left and right. Like as a recruiter, you meet a lot of people. Um, as the president of like an NPO chapter, you also meet a lot of people. And so I was really lucky to have this community and corporate aspect kind of like blend together um, because I was able to talk to folks in the community. And if somebody happened to want, like, you know, be interested in jobs, I was able to kind of hook them up with my colleagues and vice versa. If I was meeting people on recruitment calls and they were looking for a community to join, I was like, oh, by the way, like I also do this. So it was a really unique kind of pairing of two different um, sides of my life that made Japan feel like home. And so everything was going really, really well. And I was really enjoying things. I was about to do um, my first like bilingual webinar in March of 2020. But then as you know, a lot of things changed. Everything went virtual and a lot of things got canceled. Um, I'm not sure if uh, any of you have friends in Japan, but basically what it felt like was just like the door shutting on a lot of things and a lot of people in chaos because a lot of people couldn't actually do their work. Um, the statistics a little foggy, but I remember hearing something around like 70 to 75% of companies couldn't actually fully go remote um, in Japan when this happened and so, it made it very difficult for companies to make a decision. My company was one of those. Um, we, <laughs> our, our boss at the time, he was really adamant about having people stay in the office setting as long as possible until the government kind of forced us to go home because we didn't have, uh, we didn't have a really strong cloud system set up. And there was a little bit of distrust, I think, in the company <laughs> actually. And so, um, Things didn't end up going the way I expected them to go during the pandemic. I actually was let go from my job during in April. Um, a lot of other recruitment firms too that were kind of smaller had a bit of readjusting during the events because not a lot of people were hiring. And so that's just kind of the way things go and business is business. But um, I also was at this turning point because I'd already been in Japan for about four years. And so the question was, do you stay in Japan and keep, you know, keep at a new job, but there's a pandemic and can you work remotely or do you have to go in? And there's still people, you know, on the trains, like it wasn't completely barren. There was a time where it was, but quickly you'll see, you saw it like fill up and just like normal, just with masks. And every time you turn around, if someone coughs, everyone just like freezes and they just get really tense. And it was like really awkward. So um, I don't know, it was, there were a lot of things in my mind and having family back in the States. That was the first time I kind of had this uh, realization like, wow, I'm like really far. And if I can't go back, if something happens to family, um, you know, that, that really kind of hit home because I was pretty comfortable being, you know, oceans away from family, but during this time, I think a lot of people's perspectives and priorities shifted. So came back to the States in June. Um, I was in this unique position to have a chance to think about and reflect on the past four years living in Japan. Um, and I honestly didn't know what I was going to do. All I knew was that I was back in the States in a very different time. <laughs> Everyone was wearing masks. It felt like I came back to a Japanified like America. It was bizarre. Um, a lot of people tell you that you'll have culture shock coming back, especially after like the jet program or something so immersive. And I felt like I came back and no one was talking at the cash registers, like no small talk. Everyone had masks on, there was no hugging. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so Japanese. Like it was really close to like the Japan lifestyle. So it was, it was fascinating coming back during June. And, um, to be honest, I kind of, I went on this really strong, zoom like marathon like i just was hitting up all the people i knew in california across the states asking people what their jobs were like how it was going during the pandemic if they were hiring but of course like recruiting and hr at that time a lot of those departments were kind of on hold they weren't really expanding if anything they were cutting people down <laughs> because there weren't there wasn't any hiring really going on so um through that process, I also picked up some side side things and started to do things that I used to like enjoy before moving to Japan, like video editing, website building. Um, used to do it for fun, but realized you can actually do that and make money. So was doing some side projects, went back to that GPI US organization I told you about 
and was doing some teaching to high school students and university students in Japan. So all these connections from before was able to pull from and just get a little bit of um, at least cash flow going. And there was this one moment that has nothing to do with careers, but there was a um, there was a wildfire near my house actually in August. We never really have wildfires in Salinas, and so. Um, if you've seen the California news, it basically turned like orange across the state at one point. And um, it was just this really eerie feeling and we had to evacuate all of our stuff. Luckily our house was okay. I was at my family's home at this time. And um, I just had this realization that life is very short. Um, there's only so much time that you really have to do what you wanna do. You never know what's, when something's gonna change in your life permanently. And so I took that experience and basically was like, you know what, I'm going to do what I wanted to do 10 years down the road, and that's be a coach. Like, I wanted to be a professional coach. Um, a lot of people had mentioned things around age, like, oh, you have to have, like, at least 10 years of work experience before you're going to go into coaching. But um, it, it doesn't actually have that effect when you start doing the professional work. Um, it's more about communication. It's about how you can help the person reach their goals, not necessarily give them advice on their life. So the age doesn't actually matter depending on what kind of coaching you're doing. So not executive coaching necessarily, but um, I do B2C coaching. So I just wanted to share that with you because it's not always the easiest um, to jump into something that you really wanna do because there's a lot of signals I think in society that say, to do something before you do this, or you should probably do this, like that should factor is really loud. And so because of all these things that had happened in my life, I, I felt like there's no better time than now to just go for what I wanted to do. And so I hired a coach for myself to actually help me get through the, the job, like the career, like the business creation part of things. Like it's not the easiest thing to just start from zero. So I hired somebody who was doing something similar to what I wanted to do. Um, she, was all, she was like a 28-year-old coach. She was already making six figures and helping people go from the nine to five to their own business. So I worked with her for three months and started working full-time as a coach from January of this, this year. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about what coaching is, but basically that whole journey of this past 2020, coming back from Japan, but still being able to, um, you know, connect with folks in Japan and carry that on through until into my business has been incredibly rewarding. And I'm so excited to share with you what I actually do. So basically, um, I am a professional life transitions and mindset coach and career consultant. So it's a little bit of both like life coaching plus career consulting because of the recruitment background. And oftentimes when you hear people talk about coaching, you hear things about kind of future moving facing forward type of talk like okay you come to me what's your goal i'm gonna help you get there type of thing like a strategic coach um the stuff that i do though is a little bit more on the inner inner work side plus the outer work so talking about mindsets habits um kind of confidence and and self-worth and those kind of things because that also plays a huge role in like where you're gonna go in your career and it can actually, you know, if you if you know your strengths and if you know where your motivations are and kind of how you're going to excel in the workplace, it's going to be really helpful to align yourself with a career that you're really going to enjoy and thrive in. So basically, I work with people in their early 20s to C-level positions in the U.S. and Japan currently. Maybe it'll expand, but right now it's U.S., Japan, and their personalized coaching programs and that typically looks like if you're going through like a career alignment or consulting program, it's anywhere from one month to six months. And if you're doing something more of like related to your personal um, lifestyle, so like mindset or habit changes, or just going through a really big like life transition, like relocation, like coming back to the States or going to Japan, um, those programs are longer. So they're like three months minimum to eight months, because if you're going to be working on something that's a routine or a habit, it takes more time. So you really need to have that accountability with you um, for longer than a month or two to have good results and actually carry those on past your coaching program. So that is basically what I do. And I'm really lucky because 
everything has kind of like aligned in its, in its own way. I get to work with Japanese folks, um, people in, in the States. I get to use the Japanese sometimes if I need to. And I'm hoping to go back to Japan to be able to work in the US and Japan um, together. And so that's been my journey. Um, I'm gonna briefly explain maybe my top couple tips for, for getting into career life in Japan, but I also wanna like leave a lot of time for questions. So um, I'm just gonna say if you have a chance and if you found an internship or you're interested in working in Japan during your college career, definitely go for it. I know a lot of people in my circles who started out with an internship, came back to the States and actually was able to go into that career um, or into that company when they, when they were graduating from school. I also know a lot of people who went through exchange programs, um, I mean, like study abroad programs or the language programs as well. Um, I know that Yokohama, like, I think it's IUC or I, I'm not sure. It's the Yokohama something with Stanford um, program. That's a really, really good one that I have a lot of friends who went through that and then got their career started in Japan. Um, and then I can definitely talk a little bit more about LinkedIn. Um, a little bit later, if anyone has questions on how to like network um, through the internet with people in a different country, because it, it's a really interesting time right now to be job hunting, but there are totally ways to do it. So I'm gonna cap it there. And um, yeah, let us know if you have any questions and um, pass it back to Jonathan. Christy, thank you so much. That's uh, what an incredible journey. I mean, you and I had spoken a, a lot before um, today, but I didn't know about the, uh, your, your house and the wildfire and all that, and that being the, the catalyst really in terms of, man, that, you know, that is true. We all just have a limited amount of time on planet earth. Um, I had originally intended that, you know, and I do want to have most of our questions come at the end or like to answer them at the end. Um, but there is one question here from Remy that is, uh, jet specific. And I want to, I'm not sure, Christy, are you going to be able to stick around? I think you had another meeting. Um, I'll have until the 45 mark, so. Okay, 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 all right. Yeah. Well, in that case, let's just, um, I, we, we can we can wait until the end then for that, uh, the, but I do want to get to that Remy's question about JET and how that's different from um, from things like Interact and other, you know, Akaiwas and things like that. Um, I think probably Christy has more updated information than I do, um, but there is a phrase in the JET program, every situation is different. Um, but in any case, what I would like now to do is pass this off to Oyvind. And uh, Oyvind, if you can just go go ahead and, and get started. And uh, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Sure. Thank you, John, for inviting me. And uh, thank you, everybody, for having me as uh, as well. It's um, I'm in Tokyo right now, and it's 6 a.m. here. So apologies for drinking a little bit of coffee. Uh, but it's a beautiful day. And... Um, I'm happy to give you uh, my two cents on, uh, on how to get started in Japan. So um, first of all, I'd like to just share my screen, John, if that's fine with you. So um, as we always ask on Zoom calls, can you see my screen? All right, excellent. So brief introduction. My name is uh, Oyvind Lauritsen. And uh, I'm from Norway, and uh, Oyvind is a uh, an old uh, Norwegian name. Uh, I think it was uh, a Norwegian uh, Viking king. Uh, he lost his head apparently, and uh, Lauritsen is uh, from somewhere in Denmark. I'm not really sure, but um, I found my way here uh, to Japan, and um, I got good news for you. Uh, you can do the same. And I got one more bit of news. It's quite hard. So um, hopefully I will be able to uh, shed some light on how this is, uh, how this is done. So, right. What happened? I, I come from a really tiny place in, in Norway. Uh, it's not this city. Uh, I'll get to that. But <clears throat> it's this island in the back here. Uh, and only 2,000 people live there. And that is not a small place in, in Norway. It's, it's medium-sized. But I, um, I, uh, I grew up in Norway in the countryside, basically. And uh, I was always into sports. Uh, I was not the best student. 
I was uh, more a, a social type of, of person. And, uh, you know, it's Norway, so uh, you don't have any excuse to be out and about in nature, go skiing uh, and, and that sort of thing. But I did eventually find my way to this uh, big city uh, called Olesund. And uh, this is also known for being a, a sort of a Viking uh, hub back in the day. Uh, naturally on the coast and <clears throat> you know uh, Vikings weren't uh, you know people per se they were farmers originally and fisher fisher fishermen so I don't know if you guys have seen the show Vikings but uh, Vikings is really something that you you do right uh, you're sitting uh, you're sitting on the beach in your in your uh, fishing village and you're thinking ah it's it's kind of boring in here isn't it um i'd like to i'd like to go out and do something exciting so that's exactly what i was thinking right uh perhaps minus the the pillaging uh you won't get far doing that today but definitely about the traveling so I did uh, decide to uh, to get out into the world, but I was not sure where I wanted to go. So my philosophy is start on the hard end, uh, do something tough, something difficult. And if you end up not liking it, you can always do something easier after that, right? So where is, you know, what country is the most different from my own? Well, Japan is probably, well, at least geographically, it, it's quite far. And it has a very, very positive image uh, as a travel destination and also as an economic powerhouse. Uh, and I knew some people who had been there. So uh, first time I was in Japan was in 2005. And I was basically just traveling around, but I fell in love with the country uh, just after a few days. Um, I came there with a Norwegian friend of mine and um, it was a rainy day in August and <clears throat> we didn't really speak any Japanese. Uh, and we were looking for a guest house. So we asked a, an old uh, woman uh, on the street uh, in, in sort of broken uh, Japanese, <laughs> we tried. Uh, please uh, tell us where our hotel is or our guest house is. Uh, she didn't really say much. She so, sort of murmured and, and, and went back in her house. And I looked at my friend and, you know, oh, Japanese people, real nice. And, and then she came back out uh, with two umbrellas, uh, which she gave to me and my friend. And uh, wow, uh, that was sort of an eye opener. She didn't even know us, but... She was real kind, right? Uh, and we got to know her after that. Uh, she had a sushi restaurant with a family across the, across the road. So after that, it's been just positive experiences for me. Uh, I've been extremely happy. Uh, the Japanese have been extremely good to me. And uh, I've been able to start building a, a quite interesting career, which I will get into. So <clears throat> as you can see on these two photos, um, it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a contrast. Uh, I'm from the countryside, and uh, Christy talked about Gunma. Japan also has the countryside. Uh, it's mostly mountains and uh, and jungle. But um, I live in this jungle, the concrete jungle, right now. And if you are going to uh, work in Japan as a foreigner, uh, if you're not a an English teacher, most likely you will end up. Uh, here in uh, in Tokyo, right? I think um, on my on my way to on my way to uh, to Japan, I, I had a couple of pit stops. Um, I also studied in China, uh, but I, I quickly figured out that Japan is the country for me. There are a few reasons uh, for that. Uh, I think uh, also, as, as Christy mentioned, that you only live once. Uh, you really need to make uh, the best out of your time on, on, on planet Earth. So I think everybody should go for a career where they have a burning, uh, burning passion to, to do something, to make a difference. Uh, at the same time, it needs to be rooted in reality. Uh, you know, uh, you can be an arts major, uh, of 
course, but you need to realize that you, it might not be that easy to find a job. Uh, you need to contribute to society uh, and you need to be able to become good at something that people want to pay for. And uh, I figured out that uh, helping overseas companies into Japan uh, was something that I, uh, I wanted to give a shot. And <clears throat> I basically, I went to university in Norway first to do that. And I got uh, a degree in international business. Uh, and then I got another degree in Japanese. Um, and um, I came back to Japan in 2008 uh, uh, as a student. And that's when I started to, to seriously uh, work hard on, on carving out this career path. So I got a couple of photos on the left-hand side. And yeah, uh, I think some of you I might have already been in Japan. And uh, it is cool. Uh, it, is, uh, it is culturally completely different from what I was used to. It's a very exciting place uh, to, to live and to be in. Uh, it's very convenient. Uh, you can get anything you want, any time of the day, any time of the night. Convenience stores everywhere, 24 hours. And food is great. Uh, so I won't talk too much about the culture. Um, there are no uh, real uh, issues uh, about that. So in my experience, you don't have to be concerned about it. Uh, but <clears throat> if you do come to Japan, you probably will find out the first year or so uh, if this place is for you or not. I met people that came to Japan that uh, quickly went uh, other places. Uh, and there is a role uh, in sort of the expat community over here um, not a rule per se, but <laughs> if you have been in Japan for five years, uh, you're at sort of a crossroads. Uh, if you decide to stay past that five year mark, uh, you're probably going to be here forever. If you, uh, if you decide to go back, you might not come back. So I decided to stay. And <clears throat> on the right hand side of this screen, uh, it is, as I said, the third biggest economy in the world and you know all these brands you know all these companies um and from the outside it, you know it it sounds exciting right everybody knows panasonic and sony and playstation and all these things and the reality is a little bit sort of like on the right uh right side on the, on the bottom there um the japanese have really uh, managed to do something incredible uh with japan after the second world war they didn't have any resources at all they didn't have oil or or anything to, to really talk of. They, they, um, uh, they did this by themselves. And it's a society that, that they're proud of. And you can really tell when you're here uh, and, and when you work with them that uh, it's, it's quite different, at least from Norway, I'd say. Um, right. I'll get into a bit about what I'm doing right now. Um, but on my path, uh, to this point, yes, as I mentioned, I was a student in Norway, then I was also studying in China, because I do believe in getting a, a, as much uh, experience as you can. So I wanted to try one more country in addition to Japan. But um, I did a couple of exchange uh, stays here in, in Japan as well, at Ritsumeikan University in, uh, in Kyoto, and then at a uh, another smaller university in Tochigi Prefecture, which is about south of Gunma uh, Prefecture, north of Tokyo. And uh, I'm really lucky to be able to have had a couple of years of exchange. And um, that really gave me the opportunity to, to, to think about properly what I wanted to do for work in Japan as, as well. So after the exchanges, I uh, did my, uh, I, did, I did a few internships at a few Japanese companies. And I think internships are, are really amazing. Um, if you take on a job, it is a, a high level of responsibility. Uh, you don't want to stay in a job for, for, you know, for two months and then you regret it and, and you, you want to do something else. You should always stay in a job for a couple of years at least, I think. But internships gives you really a, a good opportunity to try something out and then you can do something else and nobody's going to question it. 
So I was at, uh, at Bandai, for example, uh, which is a, a gaming and toys company uh, and a marketing and sales sort of support position. Uh, I was also at JTB, which is the biggest travel agency in Japan. And then I was at, uh, I was stationed at the Norwegian embassy uh, after that. And um, I really figured out quite early on that I wanted to help foreign companies into, into Japan and, and be sort of a bridge builder. Uh, when you're considering your career, um, it is uh, natural to first think about what you're interested in. And you should do that, I think. But it needs to be uh, also about how you can contribute, like I mentioned, and how can you add value? Basically, as uh, Americans, you know a lot about America and a lot of Japanese don't. So that is one area where you can actually uh, contribute to a company or, uh, or to a nation, for example. Um, so, uh, I was, uh, I was lucky to, to find Intralink where well, they found me actually quite early on. Um, I read the resume, uh, not the resume, uh, the, the JD, the job description. And to me, it was perfect. It was, it was exactly what I always wanted to do. So, uh, I got a job there and I've been at that, uh, company ever since. Intralink is a British consultancy that's been in Japan for about 30 years. So it's exciting to work and build up Intralink's business in Japan. But um, I am not only a, a senior manager consultant at, at Intralink, I represent clients uh, in Japan and I represent quite a few of them as well. And I have uh, through the last few years. And when people ask me what I do for a living, uh, it's quite tricky because it really depends what I need to be doing at any given time. I wear many different hats. Um, as you can see on the slide right here, I'm a consultant, uh, I'm a biz, biz dev or business development uh, person or exec. Uh, I'm also a country manager for a client, but uh, on paper, uh, officially, I am a consultant that specializes in business development and, and marketing. And, you know, what is that? Um, imagine that you're a CEO of a Silicon Valley uh, tech company. You might have seen Silicon Valley, the show. It's quite good. Those are the kinds of people that I work with on a daily basis. And I used to be in meeting rooms like this. I'm in my house now. Um, but uh, business is what I do. And <clears throat> say you're a CEO in Silicon Valley and you want to get into Japan. Uh, you have no idea what Japan is or what needs to be done. So you call up, you call me basically. Um, and it's really up to me to figure out if your tech company is a good match for the Japanese market or not. Uh, to find out what needs to be done. Um, say you have this product, IP or, or, or a hardware solution or software solution. Hmm. In order to sell this, in order to build your business in Japan, do we need to uh, find a partner? Do we need to sell it directly? Do we need to improve or change the offering in some sort of a way? And so my job is half consulting to the client what needs to be done. Uh, it could be uh, taking on the role as a salesperson, actively selling it and growing it in, in that way. Uh, for Big Team Can, I'm the country manager, so my role is, is uh, my responsibilities are quite wide. I do marketing sales as well, but I'm also responsible for hiring, managing uh, partners. And um, I believe it's probably better if you, after this, have specific questions about my job. Uh, please do feel free to ask because it'll take a few months to get through all of it. Um, but I hope that gave you a, a, a little bit of an idea. Um, I work in a, a, a wide range of uh, industries as, as well. I do automotive, uh, I do enterprise software. Right now I do a lot of work in the crypto and blockchain space, which is uh, quite big in Japan, big in Japan. And uh, I also have uh, a lot of experience uh, with communications at tech market, as they call it now, and, and, man and manufacturing uh, as well. And I really love my job. I'd like to stay, uh, do what I'm doing. It's just because my job changes so much. Uh, I can stay at one company and do completely different things every week. 
Um, so um, if you want to be a consultant, I, rec I do recommend it. Um, I don't know, I'm probably running out of time, but um, I do have a few tips. Uh, and like I said, anybody can work in Japan, but it is not easy. So <clears throat> you guys are, are, are undergrads. Um, I believe you're still young, you, you do have time, but learn Japanese uh, as soon as possible. I remember I was mowing the lawn back in Norway, listening to Japanese language courses. People thought I was crazy. I went to the to the supermarket and you know i was you know speaking japanese um uh, so i'm sort of that crazy japanese guy but you 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 need, you need to be in, in, a, in a way uh because the kanji all right you can do that you can you can study but <clears throat> you do need a jlpt n1 uh, to be considered for many jobs but that is really just the beginning and and john and i uh, we have a good story I, I was with john the night that i learned that i actually passed that exam and I don't need to tell you what happened after that, but you know, it, it was, um, I don't it remember was... most of it. Yeah. That was, <laughs> you, you partied. Yeah. You studied very hard. I remember that. Yeah. And then we partied hard too. Yeah. No, it was, uh, it was great. Um, uh, so amazing uh, memories with John in Japan, uh, from those days. And, um, I, I can honestly say that I've learned a lot of Japanese since then, and you do need to. Uh, another way that you really need to add value is to be able to speak the language, uh, and then you can uh, add to that your own American and, and English experiences and skills as well. Relevant education and experience. Get something relevant to Japan. So uh, engineering background uh, plus something in business is really my uh, recommendation. It doesn't need to be, uh, for example, I work in manufacturing and blockchain, right? So if you have experience, if you can, if you want to be a consultant and you have real work experience in some of those fields, your clients and your customers are really going to feel that you're worthwhile talking to. And also do learn the Japanese language and the culture aspects as well. Because in Japan, when people tell you, wow, your Japanese is great, that is a nice way of saying cute, but try again. When you're at the serious level, nobody's going to tell you that your Japanese is good. Uh, Playtime's over and either you speak Japanese or you don't. And when you're getting into roles where you discuss nanotechnology, trust me, it's quite difficult. So you're not wasting any time if you're learning Japanese. And you're learning something uh, related to your business field as well. And number three, like Chris said, just do it. Don't uh, worry too much about it. Uh, have a plan. But the thing is, uh, setting up your career here does take a little bit of time. So I'd, I'd start uh, on it sooner rather than later get an opportunity to do an internship in, in Japan. And, uh, and uh, that way you can always go back if, if you didn't like it. Um, I'm skipping a lot of stuff just because I don't have that much time, but uh, I think living and working here is such an amazing experience. And if you have experience from Japan, I think you can work anywhere else afterwards. Uh, if you have uh, experience you can use somewhere else. For example, I'm in sales, etc. But I don't see any reason for leaving. I really love this place. I've been able to buy a house here now. And uh, I do have a permanent residency. And uh, I've basically been able to do anything I want here. Um, it is a high pressure society. Stay active, do sports, don't only work. Uh, make friends, and uh, there are really great expat communities here. We help each other out, and I'm sure Christy also knows a lot about this. So, uh, yeah, extremely uh, happy to have come here, and I can recommend to everybody to give it a shot. Uh, just checking my notes. I think I pretty much covered it. So, um Thanks for uh, listening to me, and uh, I look forward to all your questions. And we do have quite a few questions. Uh, Oyvind, thank you very much. And um, yeah, that really enca encapsulates um, a lot of the, uh, the mindset and uh, the kind of yaruki that you have to have, right? This, this motivation is just like to, to get it done, that you have to really have um, there in Japan. 
So um, I'd like to go in order with uh, some of these questions. I hope we can get to all of them, but the first one has to do about the JET program, right? So we were talking about this a bit, little bit before. Um, when I was in the JET program, it was, it was quite a while ago, 2007 to, to 2010. So, um, but I was in, in Shiga Prefecture. I'll have Christy answer this too. When I was in the JET program, really the JET program was seen as kind of the gold standard in terms of if you're going to Japan and you want to do an ALT type job, like assistant language teacher type job, or, you know, they have a CIR kind of position, which is um, you're more working with like the, uh, the, like the local government office. And usually you have to have a little bit of a higher degree of Japanese uh, fluency. I think they usually require the N2 and they, back then they, that's what they, from, from when I was there. Um, but Interac and other private uh, organizations, I think are, are fine. I mean, I know people that have worked in those, in those places. Um, I just feel as if the, the JET program, seeing as how it is a government-based program, they tend to protect the, the people who are in that program uh, a bit more, I think. And it really is much more about being integrated into the community than it is really about teaching English. Um, teaching English is really seen as the, the way, the vector you use to teach about, um, you know, in my case, American culture to, to the kids I was, I was teaching to. Um, and it was really about immersing yourself in that, in that uh, community. Christy, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, no, echoing what you said, but also um, I think at the end of the day, it's just your starting point. So like if you can get to Japan and basically they give you your visa so you have the right to work in Japan, you can, I would say it's easier to transition out of a actually a non-JET teaching position into a full-time doing something like, I don't know, recruitment, or if you have the language, you can go into maybe marketing or some other job because that contract is a little bit, I would say easier to, to end or to say, you know, I'm leaving, you know, in two months or whatever. Whereas on the JET program, I had my own experience of like, <laughs> I had a little bit of um, like winter blues or whatever. I was like not really enjoying the experience for my own personal reasons. And then found a job somewhere outside of Gunma in Tokyo at like this international, super cool looking like, school and I wanted to go there where all the motivated students were and like oh man I made the mistake to tell my BOE person that I like got a new job before the contract ended and I was like cold like in English I was like you're so selfish how can you anyways what ended up happening was they couldn't offer me the job when I went to go sign it because they have their own jets working there and so what ended up happening then when I came back was I had this big talk with the shot the BOE like the board of education director who all of a sudden knew how to speak perfect English and was like pretty much scolding me and saying if I ever try to break contract I will be blacklisted and so that's different than some of my friends who've gone to like GABA or these other places and they've had to, they wanted to change jobs. They could just tell them, yeah, I'm leaving in like a month or two and that's fine. So just know that like with JET, obviously like it's a really hard program to get into. If you get the position, appreciate where you are because you'll otherwise you'll end up like me and you kind of like, oh, I wish I was somewhere else. And it's like so many people would love to be in your position. So kind of keep that mindset if you do get into the program and you're in this position where you're like, oh, I'd love to go somewhere else. Like stick it out till the end. It'll be worth it. You'll learn Japanese at the very least. And um, I don't know. I just I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to, to go with these English teaching things. But JET does pay a, a decent amount. And the living cost of living when you go on JET is like really low. I don't know what it was like when Jonathan was there, but even still now I had friends who were paying like 300 a month, mine was 450 a month. And you're, you're getting paid the same across the, the country. So um, you can save a lot of money. You can pay off student debt. You can you get your pension back later. I'm in the process of getting that now, which is about $8,000. So you like, it's it depends, but... I don't think it matters that much, actually, <laughs> at the end of the day. I think you should just, if you want to go to Japan and get that visa, easiest way, honestly, I think is through the English teaching programs. But yeah, that's my, my two cents. So. I think it also gets into what Sunshine was asking here about, you know, does everyone who wants to work in Japan have to go through JET before branching off their actual career in Japan? No. 
if you have a, a good idea about where you want to be, I mean, Oyvind's a great example. I mean, he didn't go through Jet. He knew he knew what he wanted to get into. Who's willing to work hard, and he got an internship and proved himself. And you you go from there. Same thing. Um, even though I went through Jet after business school, I had my capstone semester at Fujitsu, and I worked my tail off from market entry strategy. And my uh, Tolkatsu Bucho or the home Bucho there, the, the, the head of my division, liked me and was like, how would you like a job? And I went through the whole traditional hiring process in Japan, which is a whole other few hours I can talk about that. But uh, yeah, Sunshine, you don't have to go through Jet. Jet's a great experience. Um, you can sign up for a year, you know, it, it goes year by year. You can go from one year to five years. Um, and I did three, you know, I mean, so it's really up to you, but it is a great chance to kind of Go and immerse yourself in the culture and learn Japanese and save money. A lot of places you're going to find uh, the BOE, not everywhere, but they'll like help you out with your rent too. A lot of places, like when I was there, they did sort of like, I guess they would call like a yachin hojo or something like that. Like they would, they help you out with your, your, your rent. Um, so that's kind of like the, the long and the short of that. Uh, the next one was from uh, Obata-san, Akina, who's a, uh, here at State. Christy, somewhat related but unrelated question. Do you have issue with visas during pandemic and how will visas progress in the future in order to go to Japan? <laughs> Nobody knows. Uh, but the, the, the issue with Japan uh, with, with, uh, with visas during the pandemic. Christy, do you have any uh, problem with that kind of stuff? I mean, you were already there. Yeah, so I, I, was, I was there. I'm, um, I know people who've had jobs where they were able to go to Japan at a certain point in this past year. There, there have been different restrictions going on and off. So you really, if you're gonna, if you're worried about like the visa stuff, keep in touch with the news that is coming out of like Japan as much as possible. And if you read Japanese and it's great, but um, it changes a lot. Uh, so just keep on top of that. But again, um, I think, yeah, I message Akina. So I'll probably, um, feel free to reach out to me like, outside of the webinar, but um, for visa processes, if you're going straight from the US to Japan, I'm, I'm not, I know for a fact that like people obviously are less willing to talk about hiring from overseas than before, but even still before it was kind of like not super available. So getting in through like a, a school program or like a language program or an internship usually is the easiest um, unless you already have like the language then you can go to those you know Boston career forum type of things and then those larger companies will be able to sponsor you um, the other thing that you could do though is like I, I mean if you know that a company is expanding into Japan and you have um, the language ability it's a good place to start out if you're looking to eventually go to Japan through the, through a company Kind of high risk but like potential <laughs> um so that's something you could kind of think about if you have yeah issues getting visas but it's a good idea to uh the kids here in the u.s go to the um the embassy website the in dc and they usually have pretty updated information about the restrictions and what the regulations are they, they keep it up to date pretty well um that's probably all I would say about that, though. The, the, uh, you just got to keep updated about it. Or even anything on your side, visas, you know, any, any uh, issues that you've seen? Uh, no, not in my experience. Uh, it's always been uh, quite easy to get a visa. Uh, I think as long as you have a job, when you're a student, you get a student visa. But after that, as long as you have a job, you're going to get a visa. And that is usually a, a three-year visa. Uh, some people get five-year visas, but I only got three-year visas. Uh, and it sort of depends on your nationality, I think, and, and the type of job that you do. But uh, I've never heard about anybody that didn't get a visa. You got a job, you got a visa. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm some sorry, go ahead, Chris. Chris. No, I just saying, so some people get like one year visas depending on the situation. And that's just like kind of men look shy, like, but the, the visa process itself, like, I know that's for people if they end up in Japan, but that's another story you should ask people about because that's, otherwise you're going to end up in long lines, um, it's kind of a process, so. I, in my experience, I mean, this is n n outside of the pandemic stuff, but, um, you know, the it was much easier for me to get my, my initial, uh, like, 
I don't think we say total Okusho anymore. It's like Zaidu Kado or something like that now, I think. Yeah, that, we have, yeah. Right? It's like your foreigner registration card. It was much easier to get it the first time than being in country and having to renew it. Mm. You got, I had to go to the municipal office. It was Minatoku, actually, where like I was working yeah. and or and living too. But like, I'd have to go there and you, that's, that's an all day thing. That was an all day thing. Me yeah. uh, updating that. Well, then was that, I mean, Chrissy, did you have to go through that too? Like updating your Zaidu Kado? That was... Yeah. It was insane. Like, that is a process. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, it, it is. Uh, there's some paperwork you need to, you know, pull together. And if you have a job here, you need to get a day off, right, to do to do that stuff. So I've done that many times. Uh, it's usually not an issue, but sometimes in summer when it's really packed at that place, mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a brick uh, it's a, a concrete building basically with people from all over the world, and it's sort of noisy. It's not very pleasant, but uh, you got to do it. Uh, once you have a permanent residency, you don't need to do that anymore. Uh, you, you need to change your photo every seven years, I, I, I think. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you're, everyone who's lived and worked in Japan, whether you're back here, you're still in Japan or whatever, like when one of your friends gets permanent residency, like everyone's like, wow, like everyone's really <laughs> excited for them. It's a, it's a, it's a process. It makes it easier. Um, yeah. Uh, you can you can start investing, buying property and things. I think that's the that's the biggest difference uh, from a normal working visa. No, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, we had a question for Christy from Zach about you know uh, you know some of the good mindsets that you were mentioning, some strategies for changing your mindset. Zach, I, I'd like to ask you to reach out to Christy off uh, offline. I mean, you saw her the website I put in the chat there. That's probably something that she can go into a little bit more detail with you. Um, Outside outside of this presentation, but uh, I will be doing that too. So um, yeah, I will actually. Though there's one thing I can drop in here um, for everyone to try out if you want. All you have to do is like copy and paste. But I actually have been using this recently with clients and with myself. It's an accountability sheet. So if you're trying to work on something, um, Zach was mentioning that like it was kind of like staying on track and like keeping up studying or keeping up keeping accountable to certain goals. Um, this is really fun to do with friends. If you have one or two friends that you um, both really want to like stay on track on something, you can kind of like cheer, cheer each other on and like, I don't know, I, I use this with friends and time block and that that helps me see how much time I've been spending on certain things. Um, and I know this was about mindset, but um, yeah, reach out to me for that other stuff. But this is really helpful too, if you're just trying to like trudge through things and it's a little bit slow. Thank you, Christy. The um, next one is from Dr. Mertz here at State. Uh, for Oyvind, could you say something about your degree in Japanese and how it has impacted your subsequent career? All right, yeah, that's a, an excellent question for this session, I believe. Uh, thank you for that. So I uh, started studying Japanese at university uh, in Norway. Uh, and that was after that I had traveled here. So I knew that I wanted to work in Japan. Uh, but um, I didn't study Japanese in university because that's that's uh, because I thought that's the only place I can learn it. I was already learning Japanese by myself, but you need a degree to prove to people that you can speak it, uh, and that goes with English as 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 uh, as well. I wanted to be an English teacher as well, just for for a little period of time, but they, they didn't take my word for it that I can speak English. So um, uh, they didn't allow me to do that. So in order to get the papers, basically, I went to university to, to learn Japanese. But um, I, I learned Japanese by myself. Uh, uh, and I studied pretty much every day, watching movies, listening to music, anything that you need to do. Um, people ask me, how should I learn Japanese? And the answer is yes. I mean, do everything all the time. Uh, play video games. I, I set my windows uh, in my, on my computer to Japanese. Um, and <clears throat> by doing so, I was able to get to, uh, to, the, to the jobs that I'm, I'm doing right now. Uh, you can never learn enough uh, Japanese. Uh, and if you, you, you can't really go to university and expect to be fluent in, in three years uh, because it's all on you. Uh, you need to do all the hard work yourself and your teachers and your professors and, and you know, John, for example, uh, they're there to help you out. Uh, and I, I suggest you, you consult with them and ask them, but it's really in the end for you to go on Amazon and buy those books, and etc. And 
uh, when you come to a uh, when you come to Japan to work, it can be quite stressful uh, if you don't have confidence in your Japanese skills. Uh, because if you sit in a meeting room and you look like a question mark, uh, it's not going to be pleasant for you or for anybody else. Uh, so work uh, extremely hard on the language part, so that when you can use language, uh, use Japanese without worrying too much about it, you can focus on other more important things. Thank you, Oyvind. Um, I, can, I can add just a, a, a quick thing about that too. And you, you said something that's very important. You said, don't worry about it. This is something that I'm seeing a lot. Um, I mean, I had this in my own journey with Japanese. Sometimes I still have this. I see it a lot with students too, is you, you, can, you can fall into a trap of being very um, almost prideful about your level of Japanese and you don't wanna be wrong, right? And that's, a, I think, a fairly uh, human thing to feel. It'd be my recommendation that when you're studying and you're using Japanese, try to start getting into a place where it's okay for you to be wrong. Yes. Allow yourself to be wrong. Yes. And don't feel bad about it. Yes. And for me, that took a lot of practice. Some people are like that naturally, but because you get embarrassed, right? You get people around you, you know, oh, I said the wrong thing or that was awkward. Yeah. Get over it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some of the, the best Japanese that I know, I actually know because I made a mistake. I made a huge faux pas somewhere and someone was kind enough later, like a manager to bring me aside. Jonathan, we say it this way, you know, or something like that. If there is one more thing I would like to add, uh, and this is quite important, uh, especially uh, with regards to what John said about confidence and, and not being wrong. Um, Japanese is, is, is fundamentally different from English in the way that, say in English, uh, my English is maybe not, you know, might not be perfect. I'm not a native speaker, but if I made a mistake, anybody can, uh, can see that mistake right away. Oh, that's not perfect English. He might be Norwegian. He's probably not, a, not an American. Everybody can, everybody senses it, right? Everybody can agree on what's perfect English. Not in Japanese. There is no correct Japanese because Japanese people have their own version of Japanese. Maybe not on the, on the, on the basic level of the language, but when you get into the advanced level, say, I got an email from a Japanese person a few years ago, and I wasn't really sure about the meaning of it. So I checked with our uh, Japanese local staff. We have a couple in accounting. Oh yeah, good job, Oivin, but your Japanese is not uh, that good yet, is it? Uh, no, actually this uh, email was written by a 50 year old Japanese CEO. They don't really agree on what's correct. So don't worry about your own Japanese. You're gonna be totally fine. <laughs> Yeah, no, and that's I mean, something that, you know, we, we talk a lot about, too, is that uh, Japanese, like a lot of, I mean, basically any other language, it changes over time. Yeah. I remember first getting into the Yankee textbooks as an edition one, I'm old, that there was a potential form. If you know any Japanese, you can get into like a Nane Nu is like a potential form usually. And now, you know, at that time, they said there's an emerging form that is starting to the youth are starting to use, which is they would truncate that to just like, instead of body, they'd be like they do or something like that, right? At that time, it was considered to be pretty substandard, right? It's like kind of slangish. Uh, but I noticed in the second edition, I haven't seen the third edition yet, but I would be surprised if we're not seeing the explanation of, well, this is starting to kind of take more hold now. Um, I definitely hear that a lot more than I used to. Um, so, you know, languages is, languages are all things that change over time, but like Oyvind said, you, you know, Oyvind's English is gosh darn near perfect, I'd say for someone who is not a native speaker, it's about as close as you can get, um, but don't try to get, try to train yourself, for me, it really took a lot of training for me to, to, to stop being so egotistical about my Japanese and just doing it, um, but then too, also, you know, make sure you're putting in the time with studying. When Oyvin and I were in, in Tokyo, um, Oyvin had, you know, big dictionaries and his head was in it. I mean, he was really studying hard. Um, and I also agree with one thing that Oyvin said in the presentation, which is something that I've actually started to kind of change, is if you're going to study for the JLPT, 
the, the Japanese language proficiency test, which I encourage everyone to do. If you're gonna go for the N2, just spend a bit more time and go for the N1. Yes. It's, it is more, but you can do it. Yes. Um, I would say if you're going to be uh, looking for positions in Japan outside of like the JET program or other AKIWA or like ALT based positions, at least have an, I mean, really N2 is like the, is the, like the bare minimum. You need that. Um, or they won't, probably won't even look at your resume. Um, N1 is going to put you in the best place, really, to be considered. And it's going to be useful, too. I mean, your, 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 your journey in studying for the N1 is going to make it a better process. And you're going to learn Japanese. It's not just to get that piece of paper. So that's just my take on that. Uh I, I failed the N2, and then right after that, I passed the N1. And I didn't really study that much for the test in between. So, yeah, go for the N1. I totally agree. I've heard that a lot, too. So, I mean, that's just my that, that, that's my advice on it. Christy, do you have any thoughts on any of that? Um, one, one thing I wanted to add to when you were talking about kind of like getting in a place where you can fail in Japanese. Yes, and also I, I noticed there's some people that are like me who are like Asian passing or Japanese passing. If you're Asian passing in Japan, you will have in certain situations different expectations put on you for your language. So don't get caught up in that because I did when I first went there and I put so much pressure on myself. I'm by blood like Japanese American. I'm fifth generation though, so no one in my family speaks. And so when I went to Japan, people saw me as differently abled and not functional as a human like they thought I was slow and like didn't couldn't just was not a normal person and so I was like oh my gosh like I have to learn this language like I'm Japanese so I should learn it faster right like so dumb like I grew up in America this is the only language English is the only language I know so don't put that pressure on yourself you, you just need to get in a place where people will actually correct you and appreciate that and don't get like hurt by it because it can be <laughs> frustrating if you can't get it out, but eventually it'll click. So just keep going at it and message me if you have any questions about that experience in Japan. So, Thank you. Thank you for that, Christy. That's, that's a really good point. I'm glad that you made it. Um, I also have friends that I worked with the JET who are, you know, uh, second, third, fourth, fifth generation Japanese. And we'd all be at a restaurant and we all had the same level of Japanese. And the, 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 the waiter or whomever would come over and start speaking directly to you know, the, one of our, you know, and it's, to us, they're like, oh, well, I guess that's, you know, logical because they, they made an assumption, but it can be, I'm sure, very mentally wearing to, 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 to deal with that. So thank you really a lot for bringing that up. I know I'm kind of skipping around here a little bit. Um, and I do want to get to as many, I know that you have to kick off here in just a few uh, minutes, Christy, but. Uh, there was you know, that question, I, yeah, about though like mm -hmm. being a, a POC foreigner, like that was the next question. Yeah. So it might segue into that. And um, if I can just like touch on that a little bit, um, is it okay if I go over part of that question? Yeah, please, I think, please. Yeah, I don't, I don't know um, how much information there is on YouTube. I'm sure you see people talk about their experience in Japan, but just know that it's like one person's experience and does not mean that's gonna be your experience, whether it's positive or negative. Um, I can tell you <clears throat> that a lot of people assume uh, that I was never going to have any, you know, feel anything when I went to Japan, but I had never been more discriminated in my life, both as a, as a woman and a person of color than in Japan, in the, in the countryside, not Tokyo, but like, and I'm from California, so I was very fortunate to not have to dealt with that as a kid, but like, um, and I'm somebody who you assume would just fit in what it like, 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 you know, like a Japanese person, but there is, I wouldn't say there's, um, there's a stigma against like foreigners working in Japan that will be blatantly in your face, but there are different ways in which you maybe have to navigate Japan. Um, but above all, I do think Japan's very safe. And I think that when you find the right people and you surround yourself with the right crowd, you will have an amazing experience there. So just, just know that one person does not define how you will be received in Japan. That's kind of what I want to say. Yeah. Thank you, Christy. Yeah. Um, along, you know, people of color uh, working in Japan, 
uh, I would encourage it's sort of a, a plug, but I was very fortunate to be able to interview uh, a gentleman, his name's Ranzo, and he um, heads up this thing called the, uh, the BEJ, the Black Experience Japan. And if you haven't seen it, go on YouTube, he's got a great channel. Uh, he goes into a lot about this, um, you know, being a person of color in Japan. And in, in his, on his channel, he goes and interviews people on the street. Where are you from? And it's, it's very interesting and very insightful. I will say that, um, I mean, not being a person of color myself, there's a, a limit to what I, I understand or, or could really see or in front of me when I was in Japan, but from my uh, former colleagues that I worked with at Fujitsu in Japan, stuff like that, it, you know, there, there, there is racism in Japan and I mean, it, you, if you, if you want to know more about that, I can certainly talk offline to, to people if you'd like to get in touch with me about, you know, what, what I, the, the limited amount of knowledge that I have about that, but it, it does exist. And um, there are numerous articles online about this. Uh, Japan Times usually has some really good articles getting into these kind of subject areas. It's kind of a taboo subject to talk about in Japan. Um, I'm hoping that that's moving in the right direction in terms of talking more about it. You, we, you can even get into discussions really about what does it mean to be Japanese and, you know, from, um, you know, a, a racial perspective, from a race perspective, what does it mean to be Japanese? That's also a big uh, a topic of discussion right now. It was very recent, I think 2018, when the Ainu, the indigenous peoples of Japan, were officially recognized by the Japanese government as being the indigenous peoples of Japan. Um, so this is a big uh, topic. I would say... Is there a stigma against foreigner, uh, foreigner, uh, you know, people of color working in Japan? I would mostly agree with what Christy said. I mean, I, you're going to run into to things, but I don't think that there's a, a huge like uh, stigma. I, or at least I didn't really feel that when I was there, or or observe it, or hear about it, like an overwhelming stigma. Or even, do you have any insight into this, or anything that you've heard from your colleagues, or anything like that? I have personally never, ever experienced uh, anything like that in Japan, not even once, but I have heard stories, uh, of course, and I think uh, don't worry too much about it. I think surround yourself with good people because the vast majority are, and don't give them, you know, I wouldn't come to Japan and expect Japan to be as my own home country. Right. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, try too hard to be myself in another country. Um, I would do my best to work within the, the boundaries of the rules of society and show the Japanese that I respect them very much. This is their country after all. And I would never give um, anybody here a reason uh, to, to talk uh, down to me right? Um, I work hard and I try to do my best to contribute to society here. And the Japanese people that I know uh, see that and they respect me back for it. Uh, the people that try to give me an attitude perhaps, or, you know, focus on the fact that I'm not a Japanese, those aren't really people that I want in my life anyway. Uh, so I try to live on a, on a, on a higher level. There are going to be bad people anywhere you go, but my, my, uh, my advice is real simple. Uh, focus on what's valuable to, to you, uh, and how you can contribute to the country and be with nice, nice people. Uh, and, and, to be, and to be clear, I think Oyvind is talking from the perspective of being a foreigner in Japan. Yeah. Yes. The, 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 the people of color thing, I think is, is a bit, is a bit of a different discussion. Um, you know, like I, that, that, that's a much larger thing, a much larger yeah. topic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I definitely agree with what I've been saying about being a foreigner in Japan. Um, I know all the Japanese people that I know and, you know, lived with and worked with in Japan, they really appreciate it when you try in Japanese and that, that you don't just expect them to speak English. Um, you know, even if your Japanese is not perfect or not even near perfect, if you try, they really appreciate that. Um, and also, I'm sorry, go ahead, Oyvind. 
another part of it, Japan really needs you guys because of the declining population. Uh, there's been little innovation or it, it's coming back. But Japan is known for being a powerhouse, like I said, Sony, Panasonic, all of this. And the Japanese became somewhat prideful. They have their own way of doing it. And then they fell, you know, they, they, they fell behind China and, and the U.S. And, and so forth. But now they've realized they need uh, they need uh, new ideas from, from overseas. So from an economic perspective and also uh, for, you know, the, the, the future of the country, they know that they need you. So they will welcome uh, you guys uh, in, in most cases. Um, yeah, just one item that I wanted to say, sorry. And Christy has, has a hard stop in a few minutes. Um, I did want to say really quickly, you know, and, and I can certainly stick around a little bit longer to answer questions or even is starting to uh, you're going to get into your work day here pretty quickly but um i'll be sending our t-shirt to christy and and, uh, and Oyvind here thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it there's the back that's wow. awesome very cool Singoy. and uh no, and the least we can do thank you for your time um the, one, one of the other questions too, you know, how hard is it to get an internship in Japan? How, you know, like, you know, there's interlink offer internships, things like this. I, I'll say in just very general terms, do the work. If there's a, if, you know, if there are a lot of companies with operations in Japan from America and other countries, get on the website, go to contact us, find someone in HR, go on LinkedIn, make the ask. Be like, hey, who do I need to talk to? To, 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 I really am interested in doing an internship in this area in Japan. The worst they say is no or nothing. Then you move on. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. And uh, that, that's my, my advice. Get on there, do the work. Yeah. Um, you can always email me. Because of COVID, uh, our company is doing extremely well because uh, Silicon Valley tech companies with short one ways really need to spend their money. So we're expanding a lot. And yes, we are doing many, many, uh, we have many internship uh, opportunities. So please get in touch with me. I'm a, I might have be able to help you out. Uh, it might be difficult to travel right now, but someday in the future, maybe we can meet. So hit me, hit, uh, hit me up on, on, uh, on LinkedIn or, or something. Yeah, please do. Uh, Oyvind, if you haven't already, I'm, I know the chat's getting a little bit long. Throw your, uh, your, your contact email in there, if you would. Yep. Um, you know, it's uh, breaking into the Japanese market is, as, as I said, you know, and as we were talking about, and Oyvind specifically said, it's not easy, but there are so many paths to doing it. You'll find a way and you'll get there. I mean, we'll get on the other end of this pandemic and Japan's not going anywhere, right? So do the work, study, get there, see if you like it. It's doable. And you have a lot of resources at your at your fingertips. I know that Christy Oyvind, myself, we have Dr. Mertz here, who's you know here at State. We're all here to help you, and um, nothing to it but to do it is what I would say. Very nice, Ina. So, all right. So, thank you, Christy. Thank you, Oyvind, so much for your time. I really appreciate it, and thank you all for for joining this discussion. I apologize if I missed a, a question or two. Uh, be, please feel free to email me. Um, you know, I think that most people here, uh, you know, just go to japan.ncsu.edu and you'll find my information there at the North Carolina Japan Center. I'll help you any way I can. And uh, thank you, all of you, for joining. I really appreciated it. It was a great, great session. Thank you, everybody. It was thank great. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.